Morgan's log, star date 6134.6. The mysterious time slowdown we're experiencing has affected not only every crew member on board, but all the Enterprise's instruments and computer banks. It's as if time itself were winding down, and us with it. Sensor readings confirm my hypothesis, Captain. The slowdown phenomena did not initiate until we came within three light years of that peculiar high density energy field directly ahead. Shut down all warp engines, Mr. Sulu. I want zero acceleration. Stand by on impulse power. Shutting down engines now, Captain. Spock. Fascinating. The time slowdown seems to have leveled itself the moment we stopped approaching the energy field. For the moment, at least, things are getting no slower. That's all I wanted to know. Mr. Chekhov, bring us around to 134.8 degrees on full impulse power. I want to put at least 10 light years between us and that energy field. Aye, sir. As soon as we began moving in another direction, the slowdown effect started reversing itself. And in moments, the crew and the instruments aboard the Enterprise were back to normal, just in time to face a problem of a different nature. Alien vessel moving along our starboard at warp three, Captain. Very well, Mr. Sulu. Shift over to warp one and remain on this course. Lieutenant Uhura, open all hailing frequencies. I'm trying, sir. Let's see what our shadow looks like. Activate the screen. Screen on, Captain. What do you make of it, Spock? Curious. Although I'm not familiar with the design of the vessel, I would most certainly say those markings on its hull suggest we're being flanked by a warship. Message from the alien craft coming through now, sir. Attention, enemy unit. This is Conrack speaking. Surrender your vessel at once or face annihilation. You do not have long to decide. End of transmission, sir. What was that you were saying about a warship, Spock? Perhaps this other ship believes we are responsible for the time slowdown. Uh, that would certainly explain their hostility. They certainly don't feel like explaining it. Damage report. One of our shields is buckling. Moderate casualties in decks 35 to 38. Warp engines holding steady. Arm photon torpedoes, Mr. Chekhov. Photon torpedoes armed and ready, sir. Very well. Bring us about to 25.5 degrees, Mr. Sulu, and we'll be in position to... A moment, Captain. Something strange on my sensor. Report, Spock. Although the dimensions of their warship are even larger than the Enterprise, sensors indicate only two beings aboard. Two? Is that possible? Possible or not, it is a fact, Captain. I would suggest it might be wiser to... I'm way ahead of you, Spock. Transporter room. Scotty, are you still there? Aye, Captain. I just finished repairing her. Fine. Scotty, I want you to lock on to two life forms aboard that alien ship. Spock is feeding the coordinates to you now. Aye, Captain. The figures are coming over loud and clear. I'm activating the transporter now. Be careful, Scotty. Spock and I are on our way. A moment later, two shimmering figures appeared in the transporter dock. The one who called himself Conrack turned out to be a fearsome-looking barbaric warrior wielding a double-edged battle axe. Alongside him was his consort, a much smaller being whose manner of attire made him look like just what he was, a sorcerer. But by the time Spock and I reached the transporter room, Conrack had already destroyed half of it. Scotty was slumped in a corner, his body bruised and battered, and it quickly became apparent Conrack had me marked for the same treatment. Captain, look out! Using all the advanced fighting techniques at my command, the best I could do was just stay alive. Conrack's strength was frightening. If any one of his blows connected at its full force, I was done for. But Spock had observed what I was far too busy to notice. All during the fight, Conrack's consort stood absolutely still, his hands rubbing his temples methodically, almost as if he were casting a spell. Acting on pure logic, Spock made an assumption, and he was right. Suddenly, the course of the battle changed. 
Conrack's unbelievable strength was quickly reduced to the level of a normal man. Now I had the advantage and the superior fighting skills. Enough! Enough! You have done the impossible. You have beaten me, Captain Kirk. Not so impossible, actually. I simply applied a Vulcan nerve pinch to your consort and caused him to pass out. Spock, I suppose I should say thank you, but I don't understand. Everything didn't become clear until we gathered in sickbay a few minutes later, and Dr. McCoy finished examining our pair of invaders. You want to repeat what you just said, Bones? It was very simple, Jim. The little fella... The name is Clee. Sorry, friend. Clee here is an honest-to-goodness sorcerer, to put it bluntly. The peculiar power running through his body defies all analysis. For lack of a better word, I'd have to call the end product of these collective energies inside him... Magic. Magic. I conjectured something of that nature during your fight with Conrack, Captain. It seems Klee was casting a magic spell to give Conrack an incredible degree of strength. Up until now, Conrack had remained somber and silent, but that was before a report from the bridge came over the intercom. Sulu here, Captain. You told me to report any change in the status of the time slowdown area. Yes, Sulu. Well, sir, it's moved. A full 3,000 kilometers since our first sighting of it. Fascinating. Yes, it moves. It has its own orbit. Conrack, tell us what you know about this thing. Our people call it the Gola, and its far-flung orbit through this part of the galaxy brings it in range of our planet at regular intervals. A more terrible fate for any world I could not imagine. I don't get it. Just what does this Gola do? Think about it, Doctor. You saw what the time slowdown did to us in just a brief interval. Now imagine an entire planet caught in its stagnating influence for centuries at a time. Now I see. Scientific progress, cultural advances, even your people's thinking processes. It would all slow down to a crawl. Correct, Captain. Klee tells me our civilization is the same age as yours. Yet while your people explore the galaxy in starships, mine are still dressed as barbarians. But your warship... Conceived and powered by sorcery, McCoy. <laughs> Not science. If it weren't for Klee's wizardry, we could never have attempted this mission. You came to destroy the Gola. By any means, we could. Even if it meant sacrificing ourselves. I wrongly made the assumption your vessel was controlling the Gola. And for the attack, I am truly sorry. Captain's log supplemental. Conrack and Klee were sincere. Their entire race was counting on them to wipe out the menace that had held their culture locked in a standstill for centuries. And now they had the help of a starship. Phasers armed and ready, Chekhov? Armed and ready, sir. Let's hope they do more good against the Gola than the photon torpedoes just did. Fire! Three direct hits, but sensors show absolutely no effect. Your weapons are formidable, Kirk. But the Gola seems to know no weakness. Incredible. Conjecture, Spock? I may just be an old country doctor myself, but I'd say the Gola was warping time all around him, making our phasers and photons detonate either in the past or future instead of the here and now. I'm impressed, Doctor. For a mind of your caliber, that is an amazingly accurate assessment. Spock, you can take your Vulcan mind Gentlemen, and... I suggest we concentrate on the disturbance at hand. Not merely a disturbance, Captain. It is now an enemy. Spock, what are you saying? The Gola is now coming directly toward us. We attacked, and now it's retaliating. That, I maintain, is an irrefutable indication of intelligence. The Gola is a living entity. Well, I'll be... As usual, Spock's logic was faultless and absolutely correct. But this revelation changed our situation dramatically. We were now up against a foe with some sort of mind. Could that fact work for us or against us? We just didn't know. But Spock and Klee were up to something, finally coming out of a huddle at the far end of the bridge. Captain, Klee and I have conceived a possible means of combating this creature. Through its mind, Captain Kirk. Spock says he can electronically transmit mental energy into space through your sensor. But even if that's true, Spock, how could any of our minds possibly be a match for anything so vast and limitless? A point well taken, Doctor. But a single mind is not the ammunition we're speaking of. Spock thinks our one chance is to attack the Gola not with an individual, but a whole culture. Explain, Spock. A composite burst of mental energy, Captain, 
composed of all the minds of every member of Klee's race down through the ages. The melding of millions of minds into one concentrated channel. Spock, you're space happy if you believe that's even conceivable, let alone possible. On the contrary, Doctor. It may be impossible in terms of science, but we're not talking about using science here. Magic. Exactly, Captain. I've already shown Klee how to use our computer banks as a storehouse for the millions of mental images he will be conjuring up. I suggest we back away from my consort now and give him room. Conrack was accustomed to seeing Klee's wizardry, but we were not. As his magic drew upon the mind streams of millions of his ancestors, the rest of us stood back in awe. It's fantastic, Spock. I would never have thought such a thing possible. Just how old is your culture, Conrack? How much further does Klee's magic have to reach? The exact date of our origin is unknown. We do know our oldest ancestors came from a far-off planet many eons ago. A planet called Earth. All of us share the same look of amazement. Earth, he said. Could Conrack and Klee be from our very own planet? Before we could explore the topic further, however... The Gola is still advancing and closing fast, sir. Klee! He's ready, Captain. The counterattack will begin now. Klee's hands were gripped around the terminals of the sensor panel. His entire body was surrounded by a shimmering aura as he transmitted an incalculable energy charge through space composed of millions of separate mental bursts, the sum total force of Klee's entire culture down through the ages. Report, Solo. The goal is charge is slowing, but it isn't stopping him, sir. He's still coming. In heaven's name, it's not enough. It's just not enough. I am afraid our race was not old enough, Captain. Our culture's history has not amassed enough mind power to overcome the goal of sheer mental strength. Spock! What the blazes is he doing? He's grabbing the terminals of the sensor panel. He is glowing with the same shimmering aura that enveloped Klee. Oh, my God. I understand. We all did. Spock was picking up where Klee left off, using what was left of the magic spell to force feed his culture into the sensors. I admire your first officer's courage, Kirk, but how can he hope to succeed where my consort failed? The Vulcan race is one of the oldest in the galaxy, Conrack. Odds are it's far older than your race or ours. That's right, now that I think of it. Vulcan history goes back so far, Spock will have billions of more mind streams to draw from. Look, I think Spock's reached his limit. He must stop. Too much mental energy will kill him. Then it happened. All at once, Spock released the sum total of Vulcan mental energy amassed through millions of years, transmitted through our sensors in one massive charge. And although the invisible charge did not show up on our screens, the result did. Look! Spock's done it! The Gola is backing away! It's trying to flee, but it's slowing down! I believe that last energy burst paralyzed it. That is correct, Conrad. Spock! You're all right? Somewhat exhausted, but feeling satisfactory, Captain. And you, Clee? I'm fine! Now that I know we've finally beaten the scourge of our race! Now that we've got the Gola where we want it, what do we do with the blasted thing? I am addressing that problem at this very moment, Doctor. Explain, Spock. In transmitting that mental burst to the Gola, I came in contact with its mental center, Captain, what we would call its mind. I have just completed a circuit that will allow all of us to hear what it is thinking at this moment. Incredible. I never could have guessed such a thing. Spock, that sounds like the crying of a baby. Very astute, Doctor. Gentlemen, Gola is a mere infant. Not a baby in the human sense of the word, but a baby nevertheless. It was spawned in the heart of a star sun millions of light years away. And its far-reaching orbit has really been a methodical search for its parent. The sun that spawned it. Yes, Conrad. The fearsome menace your people dreaded is merely a child lost in the stars. Our job now is to locate its home. Captain's log, stardate 6453.2. After using a long-range tractor beam to pull Gola behind us for several days, we finally released it moments ago. As we orbited the star sun, Spock's calculations had pinpointed as the parent. All of us watched the screen in eager anticipation. Instruments show the Gola is now stationary in the core of the star sun, Captain. Thank you, Mr. Sulu. I think it's safe to say the baby is 
home. Well, Spock, I've got to hand it to you. As a galactic babysitter, you're not half bad. See you all later. Spock, about Conrack and Klee, something bothers me. Captain, we return them to their home planet. With Gola gone, they'll begin to progress normally now. I don't see a problem. That part about them coming from a planet called Earth. I can't help wondering if it was our Earth. But there are no historical records of an ancient civilization vanishing from Earth that long ago. Curious. When I took over from Klee at the Sensors, I picked up brief mental images of his very first ancestors. They were evacuating a sinking continent in spaceships. Spock! Tell me, Captain, isn't there an old Earth legend about a civilization that sank beneath the sea called Atlantis? Atlantis? Mr. Spock, would you be surprised if you just solved one of the greatest mysteries on Earth of all time? Surprised? Hardly, Captain. Somewhat pleased, perhaps. Spark, never mind.